it was something that uh, I had to come to the realization that when, you know, when I was a Marine and I was doing all this training and, and I was bettering myself, I, I, I looked at it as I was in control. You know, I, I did this and then stroke, there, there is no control in stroke. It, it you know, it, it takes everything in a, in a, in a matter of just falling asleep, waking up and it's gone. Yeah. So, um, I, I think that, you know, people need to look at it that way as, as you, you may get your, your former life back, but you know, there's, don't be frustrated if you don't, if it doesn't come back right away. Mine, you know, I, like I said, I'm still mentally, I'm still not there. This is Recovery After Stroke with Bill Gassiamis, helping you go from where you are to where you'd rather be. G'day, Travis. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Bill. Uh, first of all, hey, Bill, I, I want to thank you for the uh, the opportunity to share my story. Um, I know I think when I originally reached out to you, uh, it was to... Um, to ask about the mental recovery part of stroke recovery. Um, really think there's, you know, there's two sides of the stroke recovery being, you know, physical and mental. And I feel like I've surpassed doctor expectations, my expectations of where I could be post stroke. Mm. Um, however, since I put so much emphasis on my, my physical recovery, um, I didn't recover mentally. I still haven't recovered mentally. So, um, I would like that to be the um, the overall uh, why I would like to share my story and help others is so that others can see that uh, there's another aspect to to recovery. It's not just physical; it's it's mental. Yeah, it sure is, mate. Um, I know the stats are that, um, and I'm pretty sure this is a global statistic. It's uh, one in three people who experience a stroke will then experience a depression, and that's missed obviously during that exactly what you said during that time where there's so much going on to help people to get them over the line um that often the mental torment is is missed and it's put down to lots of other things and i know that early on i was extremely challenged by the sudden changes by the ability not to work by um the ability not to walk uh, you know, do all the stuff that we were doing perfectly well, like literally a couple of days earlier. And, um, and it's, a, uh, you know, mental well-being is a big topic as it is. But um, I, I think that uh, we're not, there's not a, a process, there's not a linear process that we can follow that supports stroke patients. And I know for me, what I needed was I needed physical rehabilitation, then I needed this, then I needed that. And then I needed mental rehabilitation and the, doc, the, the medical system doesn't have all these little systems, you know, in place for us. Sure. And, and I think sure. we, we need to be involved in uh, creating uh, our own path forward of recovery. Tell me, firstly, what happened to you uh, with regards to the stroke? Um, so uh, to, to go back to, to day one, uh, Arguably, the two things that might have uh, caused my stroke, uh, one being uh, in 2003, uh, New Year's Day, uh, I was in the Marine Corps. Uh, our unit was about to ship off to Iraq. Uh, I was sent home on leave. Uh, basically, our commanding officer came and said, hey, guys, get, get your things right, get your orders and, and you know everything in order. And... Uh, get right with your family. So I went back home and I was, uh, I left California and went back home to Missouri and I was, uh, helping my older brother cut down some firewood. Um, just freak accident. Uh, the tree we were cutting down took a bad snap and drove me in the ground like a tent stake. Um, my older brother said he rolled me over or he first rolled the tree off my arm cause the tree ended up resting, coming to rest on my arm rolled me over, my eyes were open, I was unconscious. Um, he said, I was unconscious about two minutes and it was about a lifetime, he said. So just cause you know, the eyes were open and, and I was unresponsive and it was just scary. Uh, so, you know, I, I went to the hospital um, there in Missouri, they couldn't treat me as I was a, you know, property of the government, United States Marine. And they called uh, my, base basically and they said you know get me in stable condition and ship me back to california um, i didn't have any pain meds for three days i had uh, a broken
broken arm, dislocated elbow. Uh, my ulnar styloid was uh, broken off and floating in my wrist. Uh, was in pretty bad shape. So I got back to California um, and had some surgeries, separated out of the Marine Corps. It was about uh, three years after I separated uh, from the Marine Corps and uh, I was training in mixed martial arts it was on the top of my game. I was training, you know, training three, four hours a day, weight training, boxing, kickboxing, jujitsu, judo, doing it, everything. I was, you know, felt like I was unstoppable. Uh, it was during the 2007 wildfires that we had out here and the fires were came about a couple out, a couple of miles away from the house. And there was a lot of smoke and ash in the air. So I tacked up my stroke, uh, the onset of the stroke to smoke inhalation. Uh, I, 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 in the confused state that I was in, um, that to me was normal, that it was just, you're just experiencing smoke inhalation. There was smoke um, around, there was a fire. Yeah, there was, you, know, yeah. you had to do what you had to do and there was smoke inhalation was just part of it, yeah. Sure. Uh, so... I didn't do anything about it, it, and I was home by myself for the weekend, and it just got worse. Had a splitting headache, uh, my vision, uh, photophobe light. I was real sensitive to light. Uh, really weird. I was uh, like an insatiable thirst. I was drinking so much water. It was just pounding water. Wow. Uh, I couldn't walk up the stairs, so I just slept uh, on the couch downstairs. Three days later, uh, my girlfriend at the time um, came over because I didn't go to the gym. And uh, so she was upset, came over and found me on the couch, um, you know, fast. Uh, it's pretty much the textbook, you know, definition of the acronym. Um, face, arms, slurred, face. Cheat. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, minus the face. My face wasn't really drooping at the time, but I had left sided weakness. I couldn't walk. I was slurring my speech. I couldn't really form words. I was real confused. She called the ambulance and took me to the hospital. And then uh, uh, originally, it was a crazy story. Originally, I got uh, diagnosed with having a diabetic attack, um, even though I'm not diabetic. But they said, that's your discharge. And they said, your sodium was really low and your potassium was really low, gave me fluids and sent me home. As I was walking out of the hospital, uh, I had asked to use the restroom. So they had a male orderly uh, walking me to the restroom. And... I kept kicking my left sandal off. Uh, I had like a flip flop, you know, I kept kicking it off. Uh, and it was shortly after that, my left leg went paralyzed and I fell. And then the left arm started to ache and started to go numb and then eventually paralyzed. And uh, I, they rushed me back in for uh, an MRI on my brain. And at that point, um, they hadn't done any MRIs on my brain at that point. Wow, um, all this time, they, all your issues, they never, done an MRI? No. CT no, scan, they not, nothing? No. They did a CT scan and nothing showed yeah, up in the CT scan is what they told me. Yeah. Uh, so they, they ran the MRI, they came back. The, I remember the doctor had kind of a, a you know, solemn look on his face and, and said, uh, you, know, you know, after we did the MRI, we, they found uh, two small clots in my right cerebellum and uh, one large clot about one centimeter in my pond. Um, at that point I was already upset, um, because they, they, they discharged me and, you know, I could have went home and died basically. And I was being a wise ass to the doctor. And then, uh, the doctor, you know, kind of set me straight and said, you know, I don't know if you understand the seriousness of the situation, but you got about a 5% chance to pull through the night. Wow. So, uh, yeah, it was, uh, at that point, I, I, you know, I, thought of falling asleep, I, I equivalated falling asleep with death. You know, if I fall asleep, I'm going to die. Yeah. Uh, and I, I remember trying to stay up, trying to stay up. And, you know, eventually I, I fell asleep. I woke up. Um, it was uh, pretty scary. I, I woke up and uh, at first um, I opened my eyes and, and everything was super bright and I had double vision. Um, I couldn't make out heads or tails what was in front of me. I heard someone talking in the room, uh, which ended up being a doctor talking to some interns, but uh, I couldn't turn my head to, to look at him to address him. And then I, I instantly, I started doing a body scan. I you know, started realizing where I'm at. Everything upstairs was still working. Um, I realized where I was at. I did a body scan. I 
can't move this, can't move this, can't move that. So uh, I went to try to speak. And when I did, my mouth wouldn't open. And it, it was just, you know, just noise came out. Yeah. And what was hard, you know, for the first um, probably three days uh, up until I mastered speaking again, it was uh, like every time I tried to talk, there was like this frustration or confusion to where it hurt my brain. And I actually, I, I would cry instead of something coming out, I would just cry. And, uh, um, it just kind of, you know, went downhill from there. There was, it was test after test after test. Yeah. And, when was that? And, How long ago was this? This was, uh, October 24, 2007 was when I stroked out. Okay. That was when, so the onset probably started the 20th. I guess is when the stroke symptoms started to to happen, yeah. and then I, I I stroked out on the night of the twenty fourth. So I'm curious, um, did you get to serve uh, as a marine? I served as a marine. Um, I didn't uh, serve in combat. Um, this accident happened right, literally week before we shipped out. So, which you know was was pretty hard too. Uh, our our unit lost some guys. I, I lost some friends that were real close to me, and. Uh, and I didn't go. You know, yeah. that's kind of how I looked at it. So I didn't help with the the depression of the stroke. Um, you know, I was still reeling from the fact of of training to be this, you know, hardcore warrior, and then nothing. Yeah, yeah so. I get it. Um, so, and this is the thing. This is the other thing. Like in the old days, you know, when we were talking about uh, Marines or uh, veterans of any persuasion. Um, uh, this shouldn't bother you. You know, you're you're a guy who's trained for war, and you're a guy who's trained to survive, and all that kind of stuff. And you had a uh, you had an experience that um, didn't take your life, but I, I know it almost did, or, or whatever. But this shouldn't be anything for you. Like you should be okay. And and there's this big perception of uh, of the the guys that came back. To from war they were different but they never spoke about anything so you never really knew what their issues were until you know decades later when you know anniversaries occurred and celebrations occurred and then you got a glimpse some of the braver what i would call the braver warriors were the ones that started to speak about what happened when they were away at war etc and for me, this podcast uh, i've said it a couple of times um, is cathartic i've never experienced a traumatic i've never had a traumatic life um i've been blessed i've never had to train to go to war i, I never decided that i'd you know sign up for the australian army or anything like that but this thing that happened to me has been life-threatening and all that type of stuff and it made me question everything and um i didn't and, and it changed my life, but it didn't change it in the way that it changed yours in that everything that you were trained to do and everything that you were attempting to make meaning of and, you know, create a reason for why you are on the planet, you know, you're going to go and serve, you're going to go and protect your nation, you're going to go do all these things. All that was also taken away from you, not just who you were, not just your ability to move your arm and leg and speak. So... People don't realize that stroke doesn't just take away, you know, movement and abilities. It takes away so much. And depending on who you are and how passionate you are about certain things and how your identity is built into one aspect of life up until that point in time, you might be alive, but it could have taken that person's life entirely. Sure. Sure. Yeah, I think... Um... Part of, you know, I look at it internally, um, you know, when I when I argue with myself and in my head about why I should feel a certain way or why am I feeling a certain way is that, you know, I I was a I was a Marine and I, I was a Marine's Marine. You know, I, I was locked on and uh, uh, I had a meritorious career um, up until that point. And uh, it was something that uh, I had to come to the realization that when, you know, when I was a Marine and I was doing all this training and and I was bettering myself. I, I, I looked at it as I was in control. You know, I, I did this. And then stroke, there, there is no control in stroke. It, it, you know, it, it takes everything. And in a, in, a, in a matter of just falling asleep, waking up, and it's gone. 
Yeah. So um, I, th- I think that, you know, people need to look at it that way as, as you, you, you may get your, your former life back, but, you know, there's, don't be frustrated if you don't, if it doesn't come back right away. Mine, you know, I, like I said, I'm still mentally, I'm still not there. So, yeah. Yeah. you know, I hope that this, this helps me and I, I hope it helps others. Yeah, look, I think it will help you, man. Every time you talk about it, it helps a, a little more just to heal the heart and to uh, ease, the, ease the burden in the brain and to, you know, release that tension away from you and out into the world. Because, um, you know, people don't, stroke people don't get more depressed by listening to your story. They can relate to your story and I can. And then what it does is it makes you feel not alone even though we're on the other side of the planet while we're speaking to each other, it still makes us feel less alone. You know, you can listen to previous episodes on the podcast, pay attention to what other people have said, and you can reach out to those people because they're all lovely. They all want to connect. So, and I'm, and I'm open to that. Yeah. So how good is that? Right. So now, um, what people realize it's also with Shoke, it's a lifelong journey. It's not just, uh, it's not like a broken leg. If you had just broken your arm, you know, your, your wrist, you know, all the things that happened to you after the tree fell on you. Man, and this sounded like a massive tree. It was, it was large enough to do some damage. <laughs> yeah. um, and then, the, although that was traumatic, I imagine still there was a heap of healing because you became, you know, a wrestler, you become a fighter uh, in a ring type of guy. Even though your injuries, they, they went, they were, they were away. And you don't talk to me about those as if they're long-lasting emotional challenges that you deal with. But stroke is this long-lasting emotional thing. It makes you question your mortality. It makes you question everything you've ever done. So it does. You will, you will feel better about doing this and continuing to share. Um, and that's why I do it, to get people on to help them share. Because um, it makes me feel better at the same time. And I hope that it does that with them. I suppose one of the big deals about dealing with stroke for me is to have found another um, another why. Like, why am I on the planet? Another, uh, what's good about this? You know, what can we teach other people about? It? You know, how can I become, you know, so focused as I was as a marine, but now in a new in a new light? Do you have you started to notice in your life now that there's these new avenues of passion and focus? perhaps not to the intensity of your marine training and your time as a marine, but have you seen a shift in, in yourself after all these years? Because it's been nearly 12 years, right? Sure. Yeah. Yeah, it has. Um, over 14. But uh, oh, yeah. no, it's, um, yeah. It, uh, it's, yeah, it, uh, to be honest, it, when I, right after I had the stroke, um, I tried to get involved with YES, uh, which is uh, out here, it's uh, Young Enthusiastic Stroke Survivors. Um, I started a foundation called the CalCert Foundation. And I, you know, for the purposes of helping stroke, uh, I needed to help myself first. I wasn't, you know, I wasn't ready for that. And I needed to go through everything that I've gone through uh, in order to get me at the point where I, I am ready now. And, and I, I, I I see the things that um, that I'm doing, uh, and I and I wish that other stroke survivors, you know, at one point in their recovery, can can experience just a glimpse of what I've been able to experience in the you know the five Ks, the ten Ks, the triathlons that I've done, the the Spartans, the Ragnars, the you know, it's I'm not I'm you know if the race was going backwards I would be first place every time I'm not the fastest guy on the course I'm just out there and I'm gonna get it done yeah. and uh, and the sense of accomplishment that that comes with that is uh, uh, it's life changing it is yeah and that's the thing with me it was um, I remember going to rehab and and at one point after about six or seven months of doing various types of rehab you know they asked me so what do you want to do now and I just said look I want to be able to run and I said okay well, what for just to get across the road, so if a car's coming, I don't get hit. So it'll get hit. <laughs> that'll be great. Yeah. And that's yeah. it. That was as small as start. my yeah. That was as small as my um my my need was. I just needed to be able to get across the road, and I achieved that. And what was great is I thought that I wasn't going to be able to achieve that, and I thought that um, I run really badly because I tried a few mm. times. So. So what they did was they uh, first, you know, they allayed my concerns and they said to me, look, you're not running badly. 
um, let's record this on video. They recorded and showed me and said, see, look, your foot is actually landing properly. I said, yeah, but it feels weird. And because it feels weird, you know, it feels like I'm running really badly and I'm concerned. Right. Um, so they said to me, no, you're pretty good. So we started doing a one meter sprint, you know, two, two meter, you know, in, in, um, in feet, it's about six or seven uh, feet, you know, two meters, about six or seven feet. And we started doing really small uh, sprints. And then we got to that point where I was able to do, you know, quite a large distance so that if it was a typical road, I was, you know, standing on the other side of the, of the curb and then getting across and not being concerned about cars coming past. I felt really good about it and that was it. And then one of my main things that I used to do as I began my recovery initially, um, which I lost the ability to do after my surgery, I, I started to get on the bike and ride the bike because that was a very, that was a way more gentle way for me to exercise. And after surgery, because of my balance and because I couldn't walk and had to learn how to walk again, I also can't balance on a bike. So one of my biggest challenges is being on a bike two wheeled because I can't feel my my foot on the pedal and it falls off the pedal and then the pedal ends up scraping my 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 shin my left shin sure and yeah. makes it makes yeah. a mess of it right so what I did is I right. went and got, I went and got a stirrup one of those stirrups where you slide your okay. foot into the pedal yeah strap in or clip in yeah that's it and the problem with yeah. that was Travis um I can't feel the stirrups on there so when I stop I go put my left leg down and I can't get it out, so I end up falling, yeah. <laughs> I'm falling over. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah. now I'm looking it's for a... another solution, and the solution now is going to be a three-wheeled bike. You know, two wheels at the back and one at yeah. the front. Yeah. And it's what you're saying. It doesn't matter how you're doing what you're doing. There is another way to get, get there. Down. Get Oh yeah. Okay. End up last. I did. Uh, I have. This... Sorry. Go ahead. No, that was. I was going to say, if you end up last in the oh. race, you end up last. No big deal. Sure. Yeah. Um, honestly, my, uh, I had the same problem. Uh, my center kinesis is since the stroke is, is all cattywampus and, and, uh, I have ridden, uh, a, a, a two wheel bike. Um, it's not pretty. Um, I usually have to have wide tires on it. Um, so, uh, my triathlons I did, um, all, all my triathlons I did on a hand bike. Um, so, and for the longest time, I, I that's what I did on, you know, was was hand bike. And uh, but now, um, and not to plug any certain company or anything, but we have a Peloton now, and you know, I can now that I can clip my foot in, and and it's a stationary bike. Um, I've lost, you know, I'm going on forty pounds over a year, and uh, I've committed to it, and I'm crossing something off on my pre-stroke bucket list this year and in December I'll be running a full marathon wow. so uh it's the first time you know when I did the half marathon I ended up with stretch stretch fractures in my in my hip my left hip because oh. of my gait it's yeah. so bad yeah so um so this time I'm gonna do it right I'm training properly I've cut weight um so you know let's let's see what happens it's also um it's also good to have something to aim towards excuse me <coughs> it's also good to have something to aim towards right you've got sure. um something that you're planning ahead for something that you haven't um been able to master or achieve yet but i feel like you're dreaming big and you're going well this is the goal and somehow i'm going to find a way to get to it is that how you would describe it or you are you, or you playing small maybe you were playing small but uh, where are you at I, I I tend to jump in head first, and uh, so you know I I knew going into this that you know I was going to give 110 percent from day one, and uh, and that's what I've done, and, and you know and I and I feel great doing it. So um, so yeah, I think I'm more of the just get it get in, do what it takes, get it done, and then see how long I can do that. Tell me a little bit about your um, childhood um, and the parts about you know, expressing emotion and all those types of things. Um, what type of childhood did you have? Were you able to be uh, vulnerable as a kid growing up your, to your extended family and to your family? What was that like growing up? Um, we were, you know, uh, coming from a, a small town in Missouri, uh, it was, we weren't necessarily encouraged to talk about our feelings. 
Um, it was uh, something you don't talk about. You don't borrow money. You know, you don't talk about your feelings, kind of like that. Um, I don't, I wouldn't say it was a bad childhood, you know, at all. Um, I think, uh, things got a little crazy, um, after my mom's not around anymore. So I, you know, I, I really don't want to speak bad about her, but, uh, she had a rough time dealing with her, 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 uh, passing of her father, uh, and things got real crazy after that. So I've been kind of on my own since I was 15. So um, but you know, it's like, goes back to, I just, I did what I had to do to get stuff done. So, you know, yes. now looking at things nowadays, that's, that's my mentality. Yeah. I, I, I asked you about that because I wanted to get a bit of an understanding of what it's like now for you to go through the process of stroke makes you, makes you emotional. So you have to express that almost without choice. Um, and at least I did, um, I would just cry at the drop of a hat. What was it like being a vulnerable person for you when you had that upbringing? Because I didn't really have that kind of upbringing, but with regards to family, friends, and males, you know, there wasn't any sharing and, you know, expressing of emotions. And if we cried, we would mm -hmm. stop crying. You know? um, and it was a little bit difficult um, in my relationship with my wife sharing my emotions because she couldn't deal with a man sharing her emotions uh, it, really and then she also couldn't de deal seeing me emotional because she thought it, it was a bad thing but it wasn't so what was it like for you to yeah. go from this strung up a lip kind of guy marine to now being extremely emotional um to be honest um it, it was a shit show it was um I, I I wasn't I was never really accustomed to, to talking about how what what I was going through, and there was you know and I was I had this this tough guy mentality kind of you know going through the Marines and everything and and when yeah after I had the stroke and everything it was you know what's this crap coming out of my eyes you know what why is my face leaking you know why do I feel like this and then but I never really talked to anybody so because I used anger as a motivation for my physical recovery. Uh -huh. That's my mental recovery became anger. I became an angry person. I pushed people away. I ruined relationships. I, you know, and I said, I'm not in control. I'm not in control. And, and, and in fact, I was, I was in control. I was the one that ruined the relationships. I, you know, and I hope that those that, you know, um, that I've ruined those relationships with, uh, I hope they can find solace in knowing that, um, I'm not there anymore. Mentally, I'm not there anymore. You know, I'm, I moved on. Uh, I can talk about things now. I don't get so frustrated that I get angry, that I resort to the anger because I know that I can just talk about it and that, that helps. Yeah, that would help. And how hard would it be for the people going through that with you on the opposite side, though? Because they don't know why you're angry. They don't understand all the connections to your background, to your training as a Marine. They, they're not in your life. You know, they don't, they're in your life, but they're not intimately in your life and in your space and in your brain. And they don't get it. And when they see us act out or, or it appears as though we're acting out, but what we're really doing is sort of trying to recalibrate because... Mm -hmm. We used to deal with things like that in that environment. We don't have any skills to deal with things in this new environment. And we're kind of trying to recalibrate and we're trying to see what works and what doesn't. We act like idiots sometimes. And I did. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And we piss people off. But it sounds like you're the kind of guy that needed to do that in a strange way because now that you know that that behavior pissed that person off, you know that that behavior is not one that we want to continue doing right yeah but how do you yeah. mean you know and it's a really strange thing because we've got to go there to learn that it's not the right way but that pisses people off yeah it's it's almost like um like it was almost like i had to touch a hot stove to know not to touch a hot stove anymore yeah, it right. was almost like like i had to remap that that yeah. thinking yeah. you know um so I, I don't blame anybody for having left because, you know, like I said, you know, a lot of people were like, oh, OK, bye, you know, and uh, and they left. You know, luckily, I have a lovely wife now who has stayed with me and she tolerates it. And, <laughs> you know, God knows I love her to death for that. So I'm, I'm a lucky man. I'm a lucky man. <laughs>
<laughs> the, the wives and the partners of stroke patients all deserve medals. I'm telling you. I just, oh man, it's it's insane. They so say, do my wife, uh, poor poor love. She um she was beside herself and she was over the top, you know, in supporting me and helping us out. You know, at the time when I experienced my stroke, my children were 12 and 16. So it was, you know, really crazy, busy time in our lives. You know, she's a, she was working, I was working. And um, I remember that she went and parked uh, and I was on um, also on some medication that made me even angrier and mm-hmm. uh, made it very difficult for me um, to walk. Uh, it fatigued me more and all that type of thing. So um, one day she she took me to an appointment and she parked two car spots further away from the door than I would have preferred. And that was- It's weird what set you off. Yeah, yeah. it was it's... such a meltdown and she was so hurt by that. And, and it took me, it didn't take me, you know, 10 or five minutes to work out that I was wrong. It took me a long time before oh, yeah. I was able to work out, you know, I think I might have overreacted to that, but sorry at the time. Yeah. It was a real serious right. issue and you had done the wrong thing. So she went through a few of those experiences. She didn't leave me or, 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 or hit me over the head with a pan. Um, so, <laughs> um, so yeah, she deserves a medal. Tell me, how, how did your wife or how does she cope with some of the challenges that you go through? Because our partners, they don't have the skills because they're not therapists. They're wives. Mm-hmm. Right. How does she it, go? It's, um, you know, obviously she, she gets frustrated um understandably uh but ultimately i mean it kind of boils back down onto me that i need to say something before it gets there you know i need to say not just why i'm upset because there's dishes in the sink but the reason i'm upset is because you know of this you know this is the reason i'm you know i'm upset and or why i'm making a big deal out of nothing basically uh, um, and that goes, you know, not just for my wife, but, you know, I've had to have a sit down with my boss and say, you know, this is why, you know, there's certain things that, you know, that, that I may be difficult to deal with on, but this is why, you know, like a, a accountability, I have a huge, um, I, I can't stand lack of accountability, um, and part of that may stem from the Marine Corps uh, of the lifestyle I lived there. And then I think part of it, too, is I've been through the gauntlet. I've ran the gauntlet and I came out, you know, waving the flag. So I don't it's not so much empathy as much as it is when I see something that could be done more efficiently or more effectively. It's kind of like, oh, you know, I, it, it gets me, you yeah. know, to, to the point where sometimes I may take it too far. Yeah, I'm similar. Um, I had a property, I have a, still have a property maintenance business. So we, you know, need to be efficient because time is of the essence. You know, we only allow for a certain amount of time to get a job done. So delays and all that kind of stuff cost money and lose money and all that type of thing. And um, I think that experience has you know, brought me into if we can get something done today, let's do it now. So that we don't have to do it tomorrow. That's kind of my mentality. Okay. And then I think that went next level when I realized that my energy levels to get things done ran out at some point during oh. the day. And uh-huh. while I've got energy, if it's possible to get that that task done, I'll get it done then. So that uh-huh. at the end of the day, when I'm tired, there's no tasks to do. Right. And the dishes was <laughs> an interesting one that you brought up. <laughs> It's because just one, one little thing that it, it just adds to what, like you said, you know, I know what I have to get done in a day and it yeah. adds to like, if I see that, I know it needs to get done. I, I, I make myself do it, you know? <laughs> so, and it's this weird peace of mind that I have to have. I don't, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting. It so is right. So I'm one guy in a family of four people. So they're very comfortable with having dishes in the sink. And my mm-hmm. kids, the teenagers, um, they're 22 and 18 now, but the last thing on their mind is doing a dish or putting it aside or whatever. And that is a really difficult conversation with me. And I come home from work now, and if they've been at home all day and there's dishes in the sink, and now 
they haven't done anything to prepare for dinner and because my wife gets home way after me to, with regards to dinner. And I've got to clean up before I do the dinner tasks. It becomes mm -hmm. a real drama. It becomes oh, yeah. a, a massive drama. And they... <laughs> Yeah. And I become rude and obnoxious and mean and all sorts of things. And only recently I've been able to bring myself back from the brink of, you know, of craziness and mm. speak to the boys and say, listen, blokes, you know, like these are my issues. This is what I need done. If you guys get that done, I'll do the rest. But, you know, I don't want to be doing 30 minutes of cleaning before I have to prepare dinner because that means that dinner finishes way too late. And that means that I don't get to sit down and rest. It means I go to bed overtired. It means I don't sleep properly. And it means I wake up feeling terrible. Oh, yeah. Oh, so, and then and then the cycle begins. So, I yeah, get yeah. where you're <laughs> coming <laughs> from. We start. Yeah, yeah. I get where yeah, you're coming yeah. from, these poor people. Yeah, I know, exactly. Yeah. Um, I think it really took on a... Uh, that 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 mentality i think really took on a, a whole new level uh five years ago um i started having some uh real bad problems with coordination and vertigo uh started coming back real bad i still i still get vertigo a lot these days but uh uh went to the doctor um they did an mri um it intrigued them so they called me back they did an angiogram uh, and they found out that my basal artery is completely obstructed. So as as of now, I only get blood flow to my brain from my carotid arteries. I my uh, basal artery in the back there is completely clogged. Um, they don't want to give me TPA because they're afraid that if they give me a clot buster, that it'll cause several mini strokes. And being that it's in the uh, area that it controls, you know, swallowing and breathing, they don't really want to mess with that. So that that's kind of the rundownness that I get sometimes, you know, I do get run down faster, it seems like. And, and maybe that's why I work out as much as I do is to keep my circulation at the, you know, at the level that it is now and to keep myself in the shape that I am to where I actually have energy to, to do stuff. So, um, kind of a scare about five years ago, but, you know, like I said, since I've done half marathon and, you know, I, I weight train, I, you know, I haven't really, changed my life too much. I had to quit doing MMA. Um, I had to stop training jujitsu, basically stop doing anything that could obstruct the carotid artery. Uh, so cha life's changed a little bit, but uh, I think I'm still trying to make the most of it. Yeah, you definitely are. Um, tell me about nutrition. Has that been something that you've looked into, made any changes to? What do you do different there? Um, I, I have, uh, I've, I toyed around, I did the, um, paleo diet for a while. Um, I felt great, but it, it wasn't like knock your socks off. I had so much more energy. Um, I found that over time I, I, I watch what I eat. Um, I try to eat clean, um, usually no fast food. Um, I think I might have fast food two or three times a year. Uh, but you know, I, I try to watch what I eat. I, try to watch my intake. I, you know, I've since, since I've had the circulation problems that I've been having recently and, and everything, uh, I've quit drinking, uh, beer, you know, I'll have a glass of wine here or there, but, uh, nothing major, uh, in diet, you know, just dialing it back within reason and portion control. Uh, that's about it. Yeah. That sounds similar. Um, I don't drink anymore. Um, it feels really bad when I drink. I feel you know, I feel drunk extremely quickly and yeah. the first right. drink is enough and the second drink is not worth it, you know. Right. Um, how, how has that been difficult? How has that been different for you in social environments? Because I know for me, it's weird, but there's certain people that won't go out with me anymore because I will go to a bar with them and I'll have a... Um, mineral water or, or, or sparkling sure. water or something and mm -hmm. they can't comprehend that whole thing and, and there's a lot of pressure for me to continue drinking mm. aren't you going to drink what are you going to have you have to have something right that's like i could and i had and, and i and i'd love to but i can't I, I, it doesn't feel good you know it feels really bad afterwards how has that affected your relationships have you seen a difference i i certainly have i think um yeah yeah i i, I definitely have uh 
but I think with me, the I keep my my circle very small, given everything that that I've been through. So, you know, I've only got maybe a handful of friends that that I would go out with and stuff. And you know, I'll have a drink or two. And I think that mainly most of most of my friends know what I've been through and and, and know the the history and everything. So. I don't get it that much, but occasionally I get the, you know, why don't you come out? It's, I, I usually don't go out. You know, I, I'm a kind of a homebody. I, when I get off work, I come home, I train for a couple hours and then, you know, relax for a little bit and go to bed and do it again. Mm. So that's, that's, unfortunately, that's about the extent of my social circle. Yeah, I, I don't think it's unfortunate. I think it just is what it is. You, you need to uh, take yourself you need to be first. You need to, you know, put yourself first, and you need to make sure that what you're doing is helping you with your longevity, helping you with getting up in the morning and going to work, and you know, providing and doing that efficiently, so your boss doesn't say get out of here. Um, mm. You know, right. and that's the thing with it, that's what it is with me. You know, the extent of our uh, our social experiences is, you know done during the day the majority is done during the day it's very rare that we go out for a really late night because no matter what happens uh, and how late i go to bed i can't stay asleep and at 6 or 7 30 yeah. in the morning when the sun comes up i'm up so if i get to bed right. at 2 or 3 in the morning i'm definitely going to be up at 6 30 or 7 in the morning mm -hmm. and that's not enough yeah. hours for me when i was um before stroke that was not enough hours for me to sleep you know, and now it's yeah. certainly not enough. Balance. Regardless, yeah, especially now. Yeah. You know, my balance yeah. gets yeah. gets affected. My leg stops working properly. You know, my arm starts mm -hmm. to hurt, and I don't feel uh, I don't feel safe on my feet. You know, let alone do any physical tasks that involve you know ladders or any of that type of stuff. So, mm -hmm. what type of work do you do? Uh, I work for the government. Um, I work for the Department of Navy. I'm a civilian. Uh, on the civilian side, so uh, very reading intensive. Um, it wouldn't behoove of me to come into work slow. And sometimes, you know, if I go out, you know, before when, when I would go out and maybe tie one on, you know, and have a hangover the next day, I would be slow mentally the next couple days. So it, it was like this stasis that, you know, it took a while for my body to come back to, you know, a stasis to where I could actually live normally you know yeah. without because if i get tired then i get cranky and if i get cranky i rely on the anger and then that out comes angry travis and you know it's just a vicious circle familiar very familiar yeah. travis uh -huh. um so uh, i find that uh some days you know when i'm doing a lot of computer work it's really difficult for me um, to stay focused and i get a, a lot more exhausted did you find that when you went to work in this capacity, did you find that your tolerance started to grow? Uh, did you go from being able to do only a small amount of that uh, um, type of work to uh, it getting better and better? How did that pan out for you? Uh, yeah, in the beginning, I think um, uh, directly after I had the stroke, um, I didn't want to slow down I, on the path that I had pre-stroke. Um, I had, you know, I was three years out of the Marine Corps. I was in college at the time and I was you know, taking a fast track to get my um, bachelor's degree. So it was intense. And uh, I remember going back to school uh, while I was in a wheelchair and uh, it, it, I couldn't think, I mean, growing up, I had arguably a photographic memory. I could sit down and and read 50 terms and definitions in a matter of 15 minutes and know them verbatim backwards, forwards. You know, it was, I, school was very easy for me growing up. Um, post stroke, not so much. It, it was very, you know, a lot of frustration. And then there we go again. I get frustrated. I get angry. I know I've had some professors looking at me in class wondering why I'm cussing out a test, you know. Yeah, so you were you were the type of person that was able to really pick things up at school quite well. Your studies were okay, etc. Now, what part of it 
So for me, numbers are a real issue. Uh, mm. You know, looking at spreadsheets and all that kind of stuff really just fries my brain. You know, yeah. and, and almost immediately. And when somebody tries to explain, I've got a friend of mine who tried to explain to me this real um, in-depth concept on a spreadsheet, you know, how to get the formulas to work and all that kind of stuff. And he's really good at it. And he's tried to explain mm. to it explain it to me and I got to the point where I was like, dude, mate, I'm done. I'm not interested in listening to you talk about this stuff. I don't care how important it is. It is just not yeah. ever something that I want to sit in this do you don't understand? My brain is physically hurting when you start speaking about numbers. Yeah. Where are yeah. you where are you sort of at with numbers and what other things that you're struggling with? Um Fortunately, unfortunately, how you, depending on how you look at it, my, my, my job is very numbers intensive. Mm -hmm. uh, so that I'm usually okay with. It's uh, the concepts when, when someone's trying to explain a concept that if I can't grasp it mentally, it, it's not like it sinks in and I have that aha moment like, oh, I get it. It's, it, it's not going to kick in. It just, it's like a block there, you know, like a door that doesn't open. It's just not going to get through. Yeah. So there's, and you know, there we go again, frustration, anger. And then, so it, uh, I, de it's definitely there. Um, 10 being 10 years outside of stroke. Uh, I, I try to have these dealing mechanisms, um, mechanisms to, to let me deal with it. Uh, go to a quiet place, you know, try to block everything out. Um, something that I've be become better at is, being able to block out everything that's going on around me to focus in on what's going on. So I, like you could be talking to me and I wouldn't hear you. I'm, you know, trying to, to comprehend something when I try, when I apply myself, it's usually like everything around me goes away. Yeah. I love what you're saying. That's a really good point. So, you know, we hear about quiet rooms and people going into, you know, there's a whole world now about, you know, going into quiet rooms where there's no external noise, et cetera. And in one of my earlier episodes, I interviewed a doctor, um, uh, Dr. Michael Merzenich, you know, who's one of the leading guys in the field of neuroplasticity and the brain changing and, it, you know, uh, creating new, new structures for tasks that were lost because of stroke or some other neurological condition. And in one of his uh, presentations, and I'm pretty sure in one of his books, he talks about um, how noise, actual just noise in the environment, cars going past, et cetera, can be, um, uh, can, can cause an interference in the ability for people to learn. And they did a study where in a school, I'm pretty sure it was somewhere in the US, um, that uh, the children that were near the windows, which were the closest to the road, were not as intellectually advanced as the ones that were on the other side of the room, which was a way from uh, from the noise of the road, so the, right. the they call it white noise. That white noise interferes with the with the creation of neural structures, just simply because it gets in the way. Just right. as, at that key moment where where learning is about to happen and about and these structures are about to um, you know take hold, noise gets in the way and, and causes an interference, just like it would if somebody was talking to you right now, you wouldn't hear some of those things and you wouldn't be able to make the connection. Same thing happened there. So what you're describing sounds now like noise is something a little that you're more sensitive to. Definitely. Definitely it is. Yes. Um, I think uh, it's it's difficult sometimes and in and, and that because I may come across as a daydreamer or someone, you know, something like that. And it's not, ne that's not necessarily what's going on. You know, I can be thinking, like thinking in my head and I block it, you know, not necessarily daydreaming. I can have the task on hand, but I, I can block everything else out. Mm. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's weird that nobody can see it. And it's, it's hard to, to vocalize, I guess. And, it's weird that nobody really sees that. Uh, and, and I, you hit on it in one of your uh, podcasts uh, that I listened to that, that like a, um, an invisible disability uh, that I, that uh, I, 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 
even when I do sporting events, I look normal. I look, you know, like this beefy guy out there who could do, you know, hold his own. But when it all boils down to it, you know, unless I have my AFO on, uh, when I run, uh, I get this tone problem in my leg where, I don't know if you've had like electrolysis before and the doctor tells you, oh, let me know when you feel pain mm -hmm. and then they stop it. So that's kind of what it's like. It's like, it, it doesn't hurt. Sometimes it does, but it usually doesn't hurt. It's just like my, my leg is locked in a certain way. So I can't run. So I end up tripping on myself and falling over. And I don't know why I got onto that point, but, uh, yeah, no, point being, I, it's, you were talking about interference and in the, uh, Oh yeah. You're talking about the interference it, and being able to explain. It's very difficult to explain. It's the invisible, the invisible right, yeah, and disability. That I, that's, a lot of people either don't want to listen, either will not listen, don't want to listen, or th there, there are those people out there that will. And um, it's getting to the point that I should have been talking about this a long time ago, talking to people about this, and mm -hmm. it, it would be easier than it is now. I mean, it's hard just for me to, to voice it to you right now because I, I can't come up with the words, mm -hmm. you know, to, to explain it. Um, or I lose my train of thought and trying to do that. Mm. Uh, so I, I'm glad that I'm talking about it now, you know, and I'm glad that I'll be talking about it, you know, in the future. So, and, you know, I thank you for, you know, reaching out and saying, Hey, you know, let's set something up. Yeah. Well, you're doing a really good job of explaining it. Even when you don't have the words, that's the perfect way to describe it. Because when we get stuck, that's it. That's the example of where, where yeah. we go wrong, you know, where things don't happen for us. So, like, I get it. <clears throat> yeah, look, I think the invisible uh, illness for me is a daily issue. Uh, the invisible disability. My my wife mm. and your lovely wife, no matter how much you describe something to them, they just don't get it. And it's it, not that they don't. Comprehend. Yeah, because they haven't been through a difficult experience like us. Mm. And you know what? You never want them to go through a difficult experience just to know how you feel or what it's like. You know, so you kind Definitely. of, you kind of, you cop it on the chin, you know, is, is how I say it. You, know, you just cop it. It's what it is. They're not going to know it. So I think that's, you know, when I talk to some of my wiser friends, and when I say wiser, wiser with regards to emotional intelligence, when I talk to those kind of people, they tell me, Bill, you know, you're, you're, uh, you've been given this experience so that you can become better for it, better not as a person, not better compared to the other guy that I learn from it and understand that, you know what, it's not about me. This is this whole thing is not about me. It's definitely about my experience, but my wife not understanding that. It's not about me to get emotionally upset with that. And it's about me to learn how to accept the fact that she doesn't understand that. Right. Because that's where the lesson is for me. It's And it's letting go of that little control bit which is the the part where she must understand me. she needs to understand me it's important that she understands no that's all rubbish it's no no need for her to understand me because for her to understand me she needs to go through a really difficult time and i don't want that for her i don't want that for anybody for so anybody, then, yeah. yeah so then it's it's what do i need to do who do i need to become to become comfortable with the fact that those people don't understand me? send them love and and compassion and send them all positive vibes so that um, they're okay with not understanding me because they're also i imagine struggling at times because they don't understand me and it's difficult for them so now we find these two people i desperately want them to understand me they desperately want to understand me we can't get to that middle ground no. we both just got to grow and accept it and go you know what some things we're not meant to understand. Definitely, I think <clears throat> sometimes I, I I attain it to the fact that um, it's it's almost like we're speaking different languages. We're trying to carry on a conversation, but we're speaking different languages, and it's it's wanting to learn that other language. You know, both parties, you know, needing to learn and wanting to learn that other language so that they they can comprehend and understand each other what you know one's going through so but getting you know getting there's hard that's a perfect analogy and and the, 
um, international language, the not the international one, the universal language is love, right? Oh yeah, oh yeah. So if we can just, you know, in that time, we don't understand what each other's saying. If you go to a different country, you've got no idea what the other person's saying to you, but they're trying to help you when you're asking for directions. And then you realize that I don't know what the heck they're on about. They realize you don't know what the heck they're, you're on about. The best thing to do is you give them a high five, give them a hug, say thanks, smile. <laughs> and they understand that, you know? Yeah. Oh, that, yeah. Oh, that's yeah. enough. That's enough. We don't need to get the other part. So, look, I get it. I, I know where you're coming from. And um, I'm also wondering, you know, what have you done uh, to help yourself mentally? Have you been and seen a psychologist? Have you done counseling? Have you gone to therapy groups? What have, what have you done uh, other than try to get through this um, by now starting to be open about it and starting to share about it? Um, to be honest and candid, not enough. Um, I have, you know, I have, I have spoken to, you know, some psych psychologists and, and that helps. Uh, but there's, there's that, that, you know, it, at the time that I was doing that, there was that that marine voice in the back of my head, that 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 childhood upbringing voice in the back of my head of what are you doing talking about your problems, you know. And but I understand now that's what I need to do. And and what I've done since then is, you know, I'm I'm here now speaking with you, and and I and uh, as well as you know, I I um, I've tried to inject myself in the stroke community and the stroke survivor community. Uh, recently where, you know, before I, I looked at it as this is my problem. I don't need to talk to other people about it. I'll get over it on my own. And it, it's, you might be able to do that, but I wouldn't recommend it to anyone because I know what hell I, I'm in now at times. And, uh, it's, no one wants to be there. No one wants to be where I'm at sometimes. And, uh, I will continue to, uh, to seek, you know, conversations and, and, and 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 um, opportunities like this to to be able to to talk about it because like you said you know talking about it is is you know is half the battle you know to 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 the road to mental recovery so um and you know uh, I I'll gladly accept some pointers on on what to do too so because you know like I said I I haven't been doing enough yeah so you know what I did then. I'm a bit of a problem solver. I'm not sure what your personality is like. I know your personality is to immerse yourself into, you know, tough experiences and all that kind of stuff just by the sound of, you know, potentially your upbringing, you were alone at 15. So, you know, there's a lot of, at 15, you know, in those formative years, there's a lot of, well, you know, let's just get through this. Let's just find out what life's about. Let's just overcome all of this stuff. And it sounds like you, you took the hard path in that you chose the most difficult ways to prove yourself. And, you know, MMA is certainly one of those things. You know, why somebody wants to get in a ring and get belted by somebody else, I don't get. But, you know, it, I get it. So I was always a kind of guy, I would try and find the easiest solution to my problem. The one that took the less effort, made, you know, cost me the less, the least and hurt the least. So, so when I experienced my um, first bleed and was um, uh, released from hospital seven days later, the second, so, so literally 14 days after I was admitted to hospital, I was in a counselor's uh, office. And we had this real massive conversation that was just literally about, um, oh my God, like, uh, I'm not bulletproof. Uh, I had this thing that happened to me. I could die. I could leave my kids behind. Uh, I could, I'm only 37. And all this weird stuff that I'd never, ever thought I would have a conversation about. And I think that got me onto a really good path early to not have any of that stuff still with me seven years later. So that really early trauma got dealt with really quickly. And I didn't realize I was doing this. It's just what I was doing. And then as I got to the next episode, which was six weeks later, which was really dramatic, I couldn't remember my wife. I didn't know who she was. You know, I, I couldn't type an email. I couldn't do all sorts of things, drive, all sorts of things. Um, the only thing that was constant in my life was counseling. 
So again, yeah. the, the trauma that I experienced then isn't with me here now, seven years later. It was right. left in the past, dealt with then. And it may have taken two or three sessions or more to deal with that particular trauma. But at least now I'm not dealing with a whole bunch of traumas all in the same time. And now I don't know where to start. Right. And often the challenge that people face when they, get, when they experience overwhelm is they're dealing with a lifetime of trauma in one sitting. Yeah. And if you haven't got a really good counsellor that understands that they're dealing with a complex uh, set of traumas, um, then what they could do is you could go to counselling and feel worse when you leave. And this yeah. was one of the challenges that I really didn't want to experience. I didn't want to go there and harp on all the problems and then leave and go, I feel a lot worse. What I found was a counsellor who was able to coach me out of myself, coach me away from being myself, the, the, the self that was causing, um, that was causing myself discomfort. And she had to first make me aware that maybe, Bill, you're the guy that's actually causing yourself all this grief. And the sink full of dishes is not, is not the issue. And the, and the um, cat litter not being emptied is not the issue. Uh, it's, maybe it's you. And I remember her asking me this really amazing question. And I was complaining about my brother, my parents, my wife, everybody. And then she just said to me, just quietly, she said to me, do you think, is there any possibility that if all these people have the same thing in common with you, maybe you're the problem? <laughs> it's, it's very interesting. And, and uh, honestly, Bill, to tell you the truth, when, when, I, when I did go to try to talk to someone about it, I was guarded. Um, I didn't, it was almost like a, maybe not a fear of judgment, but I didn't want to be judged. Um, so I didn't want to say what was driving certain behaviors. I didn't want to say what I, the fact that I didn't want to talk about um, certain things about the stroke. Uh, there, there's something rather personal about having a, a grown adult have to wipe your backside. Um, there's something personal about not, you know, being told you can't drive anymore when, you know, you've driven for the last 14 years, uh, having your driver's license taken away. Um, I felt almost like less of a person. If I did try to talk about it, I would feel like less of a person. And, and I, it, it that, that was me. You're right. It, it was me that I was the one that because I was guarded, I wasn't being honest to the, you know, the counselor and I wasn't being honest to myself and you know like I said that's why my mental recovery really hasn't got past you know stage two <laughs> it's yeah. been lacking yeah look it's uh recovery from everything um uh, is not of you know this if it was just do this and do that and then get to the end then it'd be great it's so yeah. so not there but I think I think recovery from stroke is um what, what for me worked, what eases the mental state is when I connect to my heart. When I connect to my heart, as difficult as that is, and as much as my identity gets challenged, and I've got to do a bit of tearing up and what I call sooking, what happens is as my identity enables me to become a more emotional, emotionally intelligent person by crying and expressing and being all that, that the mental fog in my head just seems to dissipate. Mm -hmm. The solution is not in the head. We can't solve these problems with the head because um, a doctor can't solve our problems with the head. All they can do is fix, plug the hole or, 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 or clear the blockage and get us home. Yeah. So that's as far as the, the mental capacity to to keep us alive goes, you know, in the medical field, in any field, but in the, in the becoming of a different version of yourself, it, it happens at the heart because that's where you start to notice 
ah, well, I'm passionate about this. Passion doesn't happen in the head. You know, when you love somebody, it doesn't happen in your, in your legs. It happens in your heart. So if you start to love yourself, the, the version of who you are now, then you start to get less bullshit stories in the head about mm. why your self-worth is this and why you're not a man and why you, you don't have independence and why you lost uh, all these things. So I think I don't have advice to give you, but I'm just t- saying that you know my experience and anyone who's listening and watching is that the healing at the heart space just makes the mind quieter. And when the mind's quieter... Yeah. Amen. The yeah. depression goes away, and when the depression yeah. goes away, everything comes back, and you just yourself. So you know you are doing a lot of the right things. You're doing exercise. It's shown that it's an antidote for you know terrible thoughts and 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 bad feelings. Um, you're watching what you eat. You know you've decreased the amount of alcohol that you drink. You know, and with stroke, if I could be so brash and to say you know anyone who's had a stroke should never drink again. Uh, you know, I, I don't exactly do that, but that's what I think maybe it should be. But let's not be that dramatic. But what, what I'm saying to you is you're already doing a lot of the amazing things. So you've already supported yourself. And the fact that you've done that, and you mentioned that at the beginning, that you've taken after, you've looked after the physical body. I feel like that was really important for you, mate. Because if you didn't do that, I don't think that your mental state would be better. I think it would have been worse. So now you're at this stage where you've had an amazing awareness. And some of us guys are so thick that we don't have the awareness to notice that there is another part of the picture that we're not seeing yet. You've just had that. You're, you're seeing it now. And now yeah. you're in the most... You're in the most um, useful part of your recovery because you've seen the next part if we don't know what we don't know how can we fix that now you know what you didn't know a little while ago and now you can work towards fixing it. and all you've got to do is take the first next step you don't have to take all the steps at once just take the first one what's the first next step whatever it is for you one little right. thing that gets the next step going into the direction of you know, your recovery and your healing. And if we take little steps, yeah. instead of trying to take massive steps, then we get there. It's no different to you getting to finally um, uh, enrolling for a full marathon. That You didn't yeah. get there by roll- enrolling in that straight away. Right. Um, I look at, I, I, you know, I, I look at it as uh, kind of like dominoes, that uh, the next the end domino is not going to fall unless the first domino hits the second domino. And it's just one thing after another has, you know, everything has to be lined up, but once everything is lined up, it's just, you know, it, it, it goes, you know, and I, uh, you know, I, I really do appreciate this opportunity because, you know, in a sense you are giving me advice and I am accepting it as advice that this is what needs to happen. You know, I, I, I have, I haven't paid attention to my mental recovery, but this is the, you know, the first step is just talking about it, yeah. being honest with myself and being candid about it. Yeah. Look, I would encourage other people to, um, get in touch with you as well. Um, if somebody listening, watching wants to get in touch with you, I know there was a website. Where could they go and, and read a little bit about your blog? Um, I, I haven't. I've been lacking on. I started an Instagram account just for uh, my fitness and, you know, and, and being a stroke survivor. I haven't really paid much attention to it. I need to beef it up. And um, I don't really have a blog out there. I'm just kind of, an, you know, an everyday guy that had a really bad, um, something really bad happened to him 10 years ago. And I've been pushing to to get it going. But if someone wants to reach out to me, please, uh, Travis.Cowsert, C-O-W-S-E-R-T at gmail.com or look at me on uh, Instagram, hit me up, direct message me, uh, Viking Rider 619. So that, um, uh, those are, those are about the only avenues, I guess. That's perfect, man. That's all it needs to be just in case, you know, somebody might out there might relate to you. There might be other former Marines going through something similar, you know, or veterans, you know, and I think that, um, you know, you're in a unique position to be able to, uh, support people that are like you, that relate to you. 
And, you know, I started this podcast and I called it the Transit Lounge Podcast. The idea came to me because I was in transit in what they called the Transit Lounge in hospital going to rehab. And I thought, well, this is really interesting. I'm in transit. I'm not going on a, I'm not going on a holiday or a vacation. I'm right. going to rehab. It's a bit weird. And I started talking about uh, all sorts of recovery, people for, recovering from anything that was dramatic in life, you know, cancer, you know, multiple sclerosis, what have you. But I never really got any traction. Nobody really stepped out, went out of their way to contact me and say, wow, thanks for that. That was amazing, etc." As soon as I changed the name of the podcast to Recovery After Stroke Podcast, well, you can imagine the difference now is is huge because the people that are responding to me are the same as me. They've been through what I've been through and we can relate to each other and we can make each other feel better. And that's why I think you know, it's important. You know, If anyone out there has gone through something similar, they're a Marine, whatever, uh, or didn't make it into you know, their first tour because uh, of an injury, you, know, you guys can relate to each other and you'll be able to support each other and find common ground. And that's what we need. We need to find common ground instead of uh, trying to express ourselves to people who don't get us. And that yeah. was one of the things that frustrated me the most. And you know, is trying to go to somebody and say, you know, oh, this is what I'm feeling, what I'm experiencing, or what I want to achieve in life. And they'd go, well, you know, you can't do that. You know, you've had a stroke. You probably can't do that um, because they weren't stroke survivors and they didn't understand mm. who I should have been speaking to was stroke survivors and say, look, how can I do this? How can I achieve this? And you mm. did it beautifully. You know, with the bike ride, you found a solution. You couldn't use a two-wheel bike, so you've got a, a hand-wheeled bike. Perfect. Yeah. So, um, look, man, thanks for being so brave and uh, contacting me, approaching me. Thanks for being so brave and committing to this episode and, um, you know, sharing yourself and being vulnerable. I really appreciate it. And I think you're going to make a massive difference to uh, a lot of other people uh, just because they're listening or watching. And and then what you'll find is while helping other people, this is going to help you. It's going to help you in your relationship with your wife. It's going to help you in your relationship with other people. And it starts from these little steps. So, you know, often the, the, those first few steps are the hardest and you've taken it now, man. There's no There's no looking back now. Right. Yeah. Um, I, again, you know, I appreciate the opportunity. I, I, I appreciate the advice. It's well taken. Um, I, I, I set it in my calendar. I, I, one of my to do's is to get involved with recovery after stroke, signing up and everything and, uh, and continuing, uh, you know, maybe our, our conversations and in, in the future we can have more and maybe I can help, you know, others on that, on the, on, in similar situations. Yeah, you will, man. You will. On that note, mate, uh, all the best. Uh, and uh, I look forward to keeping in touch with you in the future. Thanks so much. Guys. Discover how to support your recovery after stroke. Go to recoveryafterstroke.com.